All right, here we go. Look, I can read all of your minds right now, and you all want to build muscle. None of you want to gain body fat. Yeah, I know. I'm basically a psychic. Some people call me Sal Stradamus. Uh, so this episode, we talk all about the things you can do to build muscle without gaining body fat. Also, we have a giveaway for you today, as usual. Today's giveaway is MAPS Strong. Great workout program for building muscle and functional strength. You can get free access if you do the following. Leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Also, subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If we pick your comment among all the other comments, we'll notify you and you get free access to Map Strong. Isn't that great? Also, two workout programs on sale right now, both 50% off, Maps Performance and Maps Suspension. Both of them half off. Go sign up at mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just use the code SEPTEMBER50 with no space for that discount. All right, here comes the show. All right, boys, I think it's time we do a dedicated episode uh, and really give people specifics on how to build muscle without gaining body fat. We get this question all the time. Can we just call this the Goldilocks episode? Oh, totally. Right? Totally. <laughs> you know what's funny is I really identify with this question because, you know, growing up, working out, all I wanted to do was gain muscle. I could really care less about being shredded. I was already skinny, so that wasn't an issue. So it was all about always trying to gain muscle. But the problem was because I had this particular insecurity of wanting to gain weight, uh, I messed up a lot. In fact, I have there's one instance that was it, where it's kind of became clear to me. And by this point, I'm probably I'm probably in my early 20s. And remember, I've been working out since I was 14. So it took me that long to kind of figure out. Uh oh, I think I'm <laughs> I think I'm spinning my my tires in the mud. And I remember it was uh, this period of time. I was actually managed. I actually grand opened the club on Santa Teresa. You guys know which one that is because you guys work there. Yep. And myself and my my trainer, one of my trainer friends, and my fitness manager, all decided that we were going to do this bulk together, and all of us wanted to gain muscle. And so I did probably the most aggressive bulk of my entire life. And literally, my my thought process was you know what? That's it. Like I've always been trying to gain this time. I'm going to gain and it's going to yeah. work and I know how to work out and all that stuff. And so I did, I gained, I think I got my body weight up to almost 240 pounds, which is very heavy for, for me and my frame. How many calories are you putting down? I, you know, it's funny. So here's, it's great. We'll get into this, but I didn't track anything. It was just eat everything I possibly <laughs> could. Anything possible. And can I gain weight? Right. And I did, I gained a ton of weight. And at the end of this bulk, I, I don't remember how much I put on, 20-something pounds or something ridiculous like that. And I got my body fat tested. And I remember being just crushed that I think out of the 20-something pounds that <laughs> like I gained. 18 fat, two pounds of muscle. It, it, was, it was like four pounds. It was something silly, like of lean body mass. Yeah. And then later when I went to get rid of some of this body fat because I was definitely too heavy. It was uncomfortable. I remember at one point I was on the stationary bike because my staff – was teasing me that I had no stamina because I was so heavy. I got on the stationary bike and I was breathing heavy and I was like, oh, I got to do something about this. I cut all the way down and I literally was in the same place I was when I first started it. And so it was a huge, massive waste of time. So yeah. Don't you believe part of the, the problem or why this is so challenging is that most people fall in one of the two extremes? Either they were like us, yes. were in, they're insecure about being skinny, so then they eat everything in sight and they don't ever let the, the, the scale drop one pound because they're worried about being skinny. And then you have the opposite side who is so worried about adding any weight to the scale whatsoever that they've they're- just been cutting forever. Yeah, they're cutting forever or just barely at maintenance because they're scared of letting the scale go up. And so part of why I think this is uh, so challenging is because I think most people- fall in one of those two categories. Uh, most of us were, you know, got into fitness and working out because of our insecurities. That's what drove us there. And you normally kind of fall in one of those two categories. And then you figure this out that, okay, I need to lift weights. And this is one of the best things that I can do for my metabolism and to look better or whatever your goal is. And then you go like, okay, well, I, I don't want to put any body fat on. I just want to add muscle. Okay. So how do I do this? And yet I'm, but I'm still working through my insecurities. Very, very challenging. Totally challenging. And I know, you know, in contrast to later on when I started to kind of figure all of this out, when I would do bulks, the scale would go up not much at all, or or it would go up a little bit, but then it was my lean body mass that was changing. And then the way I looked 
was significantly different, different in a good way. Not, not to say that when I bulked up to 240, I didn't look different. I did. But it definitely didn't look uh, like I gained lots of muscle. I looked like I got, you know, gained lots of body fat. And so this is the big challenge. It's like, how do I gain that muscle without gaining body fat? Because some of the things that you need to do to gain muscle are also the things that can, some, especially if you don't do them the right way, that can, that can cause uh, fat gain. Um, and look, this could be true. This is something that's a struggle for people who are looking to just speed up their metabolism. So yeah. you might have listened to our podcast in the past, and your goal is to you know, get a faster metabolism so it's easier for to be lean. And then you hear us on the podcast say, you should do a bulk. And you're like, I just want to get lean. And we say, no, no, no. If you do a bulk right, it speeds up your metabolism. Well, now this is even more important to you. Like, well, okay, but I don't want to gain tons of body fat. Like, what's the deal? Well, you know? I mean, there's a reason it's so difficult, right? Because our, our body's natural tendency is to want to be able to, you know, store energy for, you know, future emergencies or, you know, like if, if there's a shortage of food or, you know, if it's hard to come by. So the natural mechanisms in place, uh, you know, want to be as efficient as possible at everything we do. Yep. And so now we have to sort of go against that that system in place, uh, you know, to be able to get that kind of desired outcome. What a great point. So you don't need a lot of planning at all to get your body to store body fat. Because when you're storing body fat, what your body's doing is it's storing energy, like Justin said, for later uh, as an insurance. This is a default way of gaining weight. It's very, very easy. I can get anybody to gain body fat. Gaining muscle... Well, here's what you're asking your body to do. You're asking your body to add very expensive, costly tissue. Okay, so now we're going to make your caloric requirements even higher, which means you have to find more food and feed yourself more, which in survival terms, that's not necessarily beneficial, uh, but that that's actually detrimental or can be detrimental, right? So building muscle requires much more planning and structure. Gaining body fat is literally the default. And so it's very important you understand that so that you, when you do move forward with a bulk, you do the planning properly rather than just trying to gain weight, which is really easy. Well, it's also a, a very fine dance too that you're doing because one is anabolic and one is catabolic. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you're, you're sending competing signals in a sense, right? Or you're asking for competing goals here. I want to build muscle, but then I also want to not put on any body fat or potentially lose some body totally fat. True. So, you know, you're, you're kind of asking the body to do two conflicting things, which it, you're not going to be able to do it simultaneously, but you can do it like throughout the course of a week or weeks or months or years of, you know, kind of weaving in and out with what you're doing with your, your diet and your training. Yeah. And, and really to dive into that a little bit deeper, think about what you just said, right? You're telling your body, I, I want you to increase your caloric requirements. I want to add expensive tissue while simultaneously not adding more insurance right. uh, to, to itself or not protecting yourself. So it's like, okay, your body's like, all right, you want us to burn more calories. Right. You want us to you know, make ourselves more vulnerable to possible issues. And you want us to get rid of our favorite insurance policy against... Yeah. You know, what does starvation? that environment look like? <laughs> yeah, so... Yeah. So in other words, it's Utopia. hard. In other words, it's really hard. Now, when you throw on top of that, uh, your insecurities around potentially gaining body fat or, oh, I got to gain so much weight. When you throw on top of that signals that can be misleading, boy, does this get very hard. So no, it's no wonder that this question is so often asked. I'd say probably in the, in the last six years we, we've done this show, it's got to be one of the top three questions that yeah. we get. Uh, on a regular basis. And so I think what's, what's, a, uh, what a good idea is, is for us to not just talk about, okay, you know, here's kind of some of the stuff you do, but give people real specifics. Like here are the, the steps, here are the most important things you could do to ensure that when you do gain uh, new tissue, that it's muscle and not body fat. So let's start with the, the first one. Now, I and I think these are the, we've listed these out kind of in order of importance, definitely for the first one. Number one you have to send the right signal to your body. And the signal has to say, we need to build muscle. And the way you send that signal is through a effective and appropriate workout. So I'm going to use another example to kind of illustrate how important this is. It wasn't that long ago uh, that we started to identify that osteopenia and osteoporosis was becoming an issue. It's probably, I want to say the last three decades or so, this has become 
somewhat of a concern. Like we've noticed that, oh wow, especially in women, we're noticing bone loss. This can become an issue. I mean, you know, if you're older and you break a bone, it can really cause a lot of problems. We started seeing bone loss in men. Okay, what strengthens bone? What's one of the most important nutrients for bone health? Calcium. And so the requ the recommendations were everybody eat more calcium. So they were advertising, you know, have more milk, have more cheese, take these calcium supplements. This should definitely help with strengthening bone. Now, here's what actually happened. Nobody's bones got any stronger, uh, and some of the side effects of this were calcium deposits and arteries, which are not necessarily good for you. Mm. And doctors and scientists were like, well, what the heck's going on? Like, we're giving people's bodies more of these building blocks to build bone. Why aren't they building bone? Yeah, why Here's why. the body using it? There's no signal. Like, you're, you're, there's no signal to build more bone. I could have all of the planks of wood and concrete and bricks uh, and supplies that I want. I could have piles of these supplies, but if I don't have workers with directions, it's just going to sit there. It's not going to do anything, right? You're not going to build a house mm -hmm. unless there's directions to do so. And a workout is what tells your body or working out properly is what tells your body to build muscle. And this signal needs to be effective and appropriate. Otherwise, everything else you do is a waste of time. Well, yeah. pro properly is is the key word here. I remember when I was uh, when I was coaching over at Orange Theory, and uh, they had the first time they had um, it wasn't the it wasn't the dunk tank. It was another company that did like the bio impedance reads or bioelectric or, impedance. Yeah, yeah, either that the bioelectric impedance one or the one where you uh, lay down and it does like infrared something. Like, I forget a what body they, scan. Like yeah, it's like a body like scan a one. Scan? Yeah, like a DEXA scan. That's what it was, Justin. And they they did this and then they came and they came back and then I had I had a lot of people in my class that came up and they wanted to talk to me after class. Uh, about their body fat percentage. And they're like, Adam, I don't understand this. So it was consistent for the last two or three months. I don't remember the exact time in it. And uh, I actually got fatter. Like my body fat percentage went up and I either stayed the same. Some people stayed the same in weight. Some actually lost a little bit of weight. This happened. Maybe some people gained. So there was all kinds of uh, ups and downs on the scale. But consistently, I had a bunch of people that were actually gaining body fat percentage and it just did not make sense to them. They're like, I don't understand. Like how, how could I not be building muscle? I come in here every day and I'm lifting weights in this class. I said, well, it's, it's actually, there's a really easy answer to what's happened here is you've, you've probably put yourself in a caloric deficit because you have this goal of losing body fat and you're lifting weights thinking that you want to build muscle, but you're not giving it enough calories to do that. You're doing it in a manner that is very like, very much so like cardio. So I see you run on the treadmill for the first half of the class. Then you go over to the uh, weight area in this class and then you, you do it in a circuit style, no rest periods. No rest you just periods. one exercise after the next exercise, yep. exercise. It's not much different than what you're doing right over there on that treadmill right before that. And, and I would tell these people that this is what I've been trying to tell you guys in class after class when I would try and like give them little bits of education around nutrition and exercise is, you know, just because you're lifting weights and, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get more muscle from that. People have this misconception of, hey, if I just do the work, I just go lift weights, uh, I will eventually yeah. build muscle. And it doesn't necessarily work that yeah, way. Yeah, if a dumbbell and a barbell are involved, therefore I'm doing the right thing. Right. Mm -hmm. Not at all. Uh, your programming, how you do it makes all the difference in the world. In fact, Proper programming with zero weights will build more muscle than crappy program with all the best, you know, weights uh, that you could have access to. So let's talk a little bit about what makes an effective workout. Well, number one is it needs to be the right dose for your body, okay? Oftentimes, especially fitness fanatics, we overdo it. We think because we can tolerate a workout that that's the effective dose. It's not true. Just because you can handle it doesn't mean that it's the right amount. Um, oftentimes, fitness fanatics overdo it. You got to remember what you're doing in the gym or with your workouts is you're sending a signal. Your body often has to heal and recover from that signal, but then it also has to adapt, which is separate. So mm -hmm. healing would be like I, I, I get a cut on my hand and it heals. Adapting would be my body then develops a callus over that cut so that next time if I were to scratch my hand again, it wouldn't get cut like it did before. This is the same with a resistance training. So it needs to be the appropriate dose, but let's get a little bit more specific. Let's start with exercises first. When it comes to exercises, they are not all created equal when it comes to stability, when it comes to corrective purposes, when it comes to building muscle. 
Some exercises are amazing at building muscle. Other exercises, not so much. Which ones are the most effective at building muscle? It's the compound lift. basic compound lift, gross motor movement type exercises. I can name most of them right now, right? Barbell squatting, deadlifting, bench pressing, rowing, overhead pressing. Like those exercises I just named are more effective than all the other exercises that you can think of on a, in a one per one comparison basis when it comes to building muscle. Now, are there exceptions to this rule? Yeah, I'm sure there's exceptions. The bodybuilder who's like, oh, I get more connection doing this. Okay, I get that. But generally speaking, those exercises by far are going to build the most muscle. So if you're not doing those exercises and you expect to build muscle without gaining body fat, you're literally taking out some of the most effective tools out of your toolbox. Well, and speaking to that, that signal, you want that signal to be loud. Okay. And that's why the compound lifts, you know, play a major contribution to that because of every, you know, bit of muscles you have to recruit to be able to pull off a lot of these movements through a multi-joint uh, movement. Uh, and so to, to be able to wrap that into your programming is going to be essential when you're kind of constructing it towards building muscle, but also what have you been doing for a long period of time, especially for experienced lifters, uh, you kind of get into a point where you get into a rut and, and, you know, if you haven't changed up your programming and, and adjusted some of these acute variables, like, you know, the amount of reps you're doing, uh, you know, maybe shifting it more into a hypertrophy range versus, you know, like just, you know, doing our five rep type of, of protocol. Uh, these are things to consider in terms of adding a new stimulus for your body to adapt to. Maybe you're too adapted right now. Mm, absolutely. That's a great point. So, Let's talk about general, and remember there's always individual variances, but generally speaking, studies show, and our experience backs this up, that working body parts anywhere between two to three days a week is probably ideal for most people. So the old, you know, work your back and your chest and your legs and whatever once a week, uh, that old message is wrong. Uh, studies show uh, that about two days a week or three days a week is probably ideal for most people. Going to failure on your sets is too much intensity most of the time. So don't go to failure, but rather stop one or two reps short of that. Rep ranges, Justin just touched on that. Most of the rep ranges build muscle. So anywhere, and I'll, I'll be a little bit more specific, right? Rep ranges between five reps as high as 30 reps. All of them will build muscle. Which one do I pick? the one that you're not accustomed to doing. If you're always in the five rep range, I guarantee if you move to the 20 rep range or the 15 rep range, you're going to see bigger changes. On the contrary or the flip side, if you're the person that's always doing the 15 rep range, you do some sets of five reps and you do this for you know a few weeks, you're going to see uh, some of the best results doing that. Well, I think well, this is one of my favorite hacks and I'm glad it's the first one because it's still to this day, like this is like my go-to move. Anytime I transition out of a cut or a bulk. So regardless of what your goal is, when I make a decision that I'm going to try and move my body fat percentage or add more lean mass, I also like to transition into another program. And, I, and it can be rep ranges like you talked about. It could be tempos. It could be new exercises that you weren't doing in there. Like any, any and or all of the above is ideal because the way I look at it is the the more unique the louder the, the the more unique the exercise or more unique the programming is compared to what it uh, what I was currently doing the louder the signal is and the more likely that any additional calories that I take in will get allocated to building muscle versus storing body fat I just think this is one of the best insurance that you can do when you're you're trying to achieve this goal totally now in terms of total volume per body part uh, studies will show and again this is also backed by our experience. Anywhere between about nine total sets per week and maybe as high as like 18 sets uh, total per week will work best. Anything more or less than that, and studies show that that doesn't really do as well. Now, there's a, there's a bit of a range there, right? Nine to 18 sets. This is where you got to kind of figure it out for yourself. Where should you start, right? People are like, well, should I start with 18 and back down? No, you're better off starting with nine and then moving up for there. I know Adam always says... You want to do the the least amount of work to get the most amount of results. This is very true uh, when it comes to your total volume. I think if you're not sure, I would start with the nine sets per week and see how everything is responding, and then you can move up from there. It's much harder to go overboard and then back down. Now, I know that when it comes to workout programming, 
Things can get very technical, exercise order. What about tempo? You know, we talked about frequency and volume and, you know, oh, there's so many different factors that make workout program a little bit technical. And so if you're somebody that's like, okay, I just want, I just want the specifics and I want to follow something that I know is well written. The best muscle building programs that we offer for bulking include MAPS Anabolic, I would say MAPS Aesthetic, MAPS Powerlift, MAPS Strong are probably the ones I would say are probably the best you for, for bulking. Split also. Thank yeah. you very much. So there's, yeah. there's five programs right there that you could kind of choose from. All of them are really, really good for gaining muscle. They're really, really good at sending the right signal. Which one do you pick? Well, when you go on our site, mapsfitnessproducts.com, look at the program, look at the description. The one that's kind of most different from what you're used to, that one's probably going to give you uh, the best results. If you train like a bodybuilder all the time, Maps Powerlift will probably be good or Maps Strong. And then, you know, vice versa. And don't get suckered into marketing and advertising around uh, programming that's built for, you know, losing body fat. Like you'll get, you'll like hit, for example, yeah. is widely marketed as the best program for burning, for burning body fat. That has everything to do with, you could build, you could bulk in a, on, on hit. Yeah. yeah, this, yeah. this idea of that, the, the, the programming is what's going to burn the body fat. It has, that has everything to do with you nutritionally. You can take one program run it in a calorie surplus and it becomes a great program for building muscle and bulking. You could take that same program, run it in a caloric deficit, and it now becomes a great program for losing body fat. Right. So, so. so let's talk about nutrition because this is a very important component. And this is where I think, aside from workouts, this is where most people make the biggest uh, mistakes. So here's the first most important thing. You can't get around this. In order to gain new tissue, you need extra calories. Okay. So what does that mean, extra calories? It means more calories then are required to maintain your current level of, uh, of fitness, health, and body weight. Okay, so if you're consuming 2,500 calories a day and you're not gaining weight, you're not losing weight, you're just maintaining, in order to gain, you have to go above this. Now, here's where people tend to screw up, especially people like myself, mm -hmm. you know, like the story I told about earlier, is we just go nuts with the bulk. So we go, I want to gain... Let's see how much I could possibly eat. Here's the truth. Even if you were to gain one pound of lean body mass a week, which is a lot, that's a lot of muscle, like lean muscle a week, that's a lot to gain in a week. Even if you did that, it would not require 1,000 or 2,000 extra calories a day. That's just way more than your body needs to gain that one pound per week. It's actually much lower than that. So the first thing I would say is start by tracking and then do a small surplus. For most of you, this means anywhere between 200 to 500 calories above what your maintenance calories are. That's probably going to be the sweet spot for most of you in terms of the right amount of calories to bulk. Now, those of you that are afraid of gaining body fat, because we just talked about, you know, we, we kind of talked a lot about the person who's like, I just want to gain weight and I don't care. Well, what about the people who are like, well, I want to bulk, I want to speed up my metabolism, but I don't want to gain body fat. You still need to go into surplus of calories to make this happen. It's not going to happen at maintenance. It's definitely not going to happen at deficit. So this advice is true for everybody who wants to bulk. You got to go above your maintenance calories. Make it a small bulk, bulk two to five hundred calories. Above. I, I have such a hard. That's why I sometimes I don't like when we talk about the small surplus because it really depends on who I'm talking to. If I'm I'm leaning like I'm definitely telling that to the insecure young version of you or me, right? right like right. I'm definitely telling like, yo kid, you don't need to, yeah, you, don't you don't need, need to, to over 700 it. to a yeah. thousand calories every single day. And we're not, we're like, I'm telling that kid that he, or person that, you know, the surplus just needs to be very little. But then I also know the other end of the spectrum where you have somebody who's so afraid yeah. to eat even the slightest bit over and you say, oh, you just need a tiny little surplus. And they like 20 calories. Yes. <laughs> and they're leaning on that or they might hit a surplus on one day, but then they have a day where it's a deficit the very yeah. next day. And so it's averaging out to be maintenance still or lower. And so telling that person, I'm like, you know, don't be afraid to put it like, listen, uh, and I know this is a generic number, but you know, 3,500 cal extra, 3,500 extra calories equals one pound of fat. So even if you overestimate by a hundred, okay, every single day, you still are only talking about a 700 calorie surplus on that. At that rate, it would take you over a month before you would even put on one pound of body fat. Right. So don't, I mean, even though we're saying small surplus, if you're that person who's so 
afraid of adding little calories. Do not freak out of adding an extra 50 or 100 because at the end of the day, even at that rate, even if it was more than you needed, uh, 100 extra calories a day is still not going to give you a pound of fat in a week or two. No, and and it needs to be consistent, by the way. So you said something that I think is an important point. Like uh, one day they're in a surplus and the next day they go down to maintenance. It needs to be a surplus consistently, uh, definitely by the end of the week, because sometimes people are in a surplus Monday through Friday, right. Saturday and Sunday, they go off, they skip breakfast, they sleep in, whatever, or they freak out over the fact that they were in a surplus for five days, so they, they drop it down Saturday Sunday. Then you do the math, and it's like you're barely in a surplus or you're not because it just wasn't consistent. So when I'm saying two to 500 calories a day, that's what it's averaging out to, and it needs to be relatively consistent. Uh, for this to happen, not just you know Monday through Friday, but rather every single day, or at least averages out to be that much uh, every single day. And the other thing is to to make sure you're getting quality food and and high protein. Um, I remember another mistake that I made as a kid, as I when I was bulking, was I just eat everything in sight. And I remember I wasn't tracking at first, and then I began to track, and then I realized, oh my god, I'm just eating you know, sugar and fat and my, pro I'm coming, I'm hitting over on my calories, but then I'm not getting enough yeah. protein mm -hmm. for my body to build and recover like I need it to. And so then you end up putting on body fat, but then I don't really add very much muscle. So it is important to make sure that you're on a good high protein diet when you're trying to do this. Yeah. You know, what's interesting is that they actually, there are some studies that shows very interesting effect where calories are controlled, <clears throat> but one group has high protein, the other group doesn't. So the same calories, the higher protein tends to lean towards more muscle, even with the same calories. So protein is a very important macronutrient. I would say aim for just to be, you know, just to know you hit the mark. One to one body yeah, weight. Yeah, about That's one easy. gram of protein per pound of body weight. That's probably overdoing it a little bit, but it's, it's such an it's easy okay. way though. Yes. Like, you know, everybody like in our space loves Yeah, you can to, get real specific. Right? Loves to get in the debates over if it's 0.7 or 0.8 or if you're whatever, it's 1.5 per kilogram of lean body. I mean, it's dude, just whatever you weigh eat a gram of protein for that, unless you are considered uh, severely obese. If you're se severely obese, then it, it does, there's a little value in you actually figuring out your exact lean body mass and, and using going, that yeah. and using that. But for the, for the general population, most people, unless you are, like I said, clinically obese, uh, you're probably going to be just fine targeting one-to-one -one, and it's easy to pay attention to it. That yeah. Way. And it's, it's a bit challenging once you start really focusing on upping your protein. If you're doing that from a whole foods uh, perspective, if you haven't been used to eating that much meat in your diet uh, and there is the option of protein powders, but the, 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 the reason I bring this up is because much like Sal, when I was trying to bulk, uh, you know, the majority of that started to come from protein powders, yeah. which were, you know, riddled with sweeteners and all these other things that, uh, that they added uh, with that. And the calories got out of control, but also, too, I wasn't really... Uh, you know, in a good ratio at that point too, by bringing it, like focusing it all just on the protein powder. Yeah. The way I would use protein, um, you know, Adam's talked about this and I think this is really, really smart is you have a protein powder and you use it uh, just in case. Right. And so what you do at the end of the day, if you're tracking, which I think is important, by the way, tracking is going to be imperative if you're trying to gain muscle without gaining body fat. Trying to wing this is going to be really, really hard to do, and I would only reserve that for the most in-touch, in-tune people. Oh, my God. Yeah. This is really hard. To Especially for this. Yeah, right? because you're, it's already such a fine dance to, to think yeah. that you're not going to— It's a very thin line. Yeah, it's very, it's, It has to be very controlled, and it's, it's very, very challenging. So you should definitely be tracking if your goal is gain muscle without gaining body fat. So at the end of the day— Let's say you weigh 140 pounds and your protein now, at the end of the day, you're like, okay, let me calculate it all up. Oh man, I'm at 110 grams of protein. Here's where protein powder now comes in handy. Now all I have to do is throw a scoop of protein in a glass of water or whatever, drink it, and I've hit my protein targets. I think that is a beautiful way to use protein, I, I, protein powder. I don't think the best way is to aim for hitting the target right out the gates with it because you tend to negate the most important you know things that you could eat which are whole foods yeah and then you end up to justin's point having two or three shakes plus two or three bars and like 80 percent of now your it's protein take, yeah it came from process which you know in the context of you know losing or gaining you know calories and stuff like that that's fine it'll get you by but there's just the getting whole foods there's so many other benefits from the whole foods that you're getting aside from just the protein that you're missing out on when oh you do that. I, i'll tell you what i and i've done this a couple times 
when my protein is from shakes versus when my protein is from steak or ground beef or chicken or fish, even if everything else is pretty much the same, I build more muscle, have more strength and feel healthier with the whole natural foods. Mm -hmm. So aim for that. You know, what's funny is that I've had friends who compete in bodybuilding and stuff like that. Actually, Adam, didn't you re uh, experiment with this I yourself? Did this. I did this with a show where I, I did a, I did a couple shows where I did a hundred percent whole foods, no, no bars or shakes whatsoever. And then I did uh, uh, other shows where I allowed shakes and bars as much as I wanted. If I wanted two or th I, there was times where I had four bars and a shake in a day and like allowed that. I was like, okay, I'm going to just, I'm just to stick to calories. That's all, and 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 my macros. Where the it's coming from, I'm not going to worry about it. And there was a clear difference, man, for me. There was a clear, and for me, it's, it's you know, obviously, I'm I'm being judged by the way I look. So more than anything else, you, there was a, a look that I had that was not the same as on Whole Foods, and you know, and there could be many variables about that, right? It could be the fact that I'm not getting everything yeah, the that labels I get from Whole are... Foods. It could be that labels can be what up to twenty something percent right. off, and so maybe the other ones were saying they're much higher than in protein than they actually were, or they're lower in calorie than when they actually were, and so there was actually a discrepancy between calories where Whole Foods, if I'm weighing and measuring some of that, should be really accurate and compared to process stuff. So I can't tell you exactly, but I can definitely tell you that I did it enough times and compared that there were, I got a better look when I was running everything from Whole Foods. Now, here's another tip uh, is to utilize kind of mini periods of maintenance or cutting within your long bulking cycle. So in other words, to give you an example, let's say you do, you're doing a bulk and it's lasting uh, 10 weeks, right? So it's uh, two and a half months. So two and a half months, I'm going to bulk. I'm eating two to 500 calories extra. I'm doing the good workout. I'm doing all the stuff, high protein. Um, within that period of time, I think it's important to have a day or two uh, in each week or a week after every you know three or four weeks where you eat at maintenance and throw in a couple days of lower calories. Now, why is this important? Well, let's start with the psychological first. And I think this is the most important, by the way. And I know people oftentimes watching don't care about this because they don't consider it and they just look at the physiological but I'm going to tell you something right now. The psychological is the most important. Uh, if you think of anything that's ever stopped you from achieving your fitness goals, it almost always goes down to psychological aspects. So why is this important? Because it gets tedious. It gets boring. It gets frustrating when you're constantly pushing for the same thing over and over again. And how does that manifest? My appetite goes down. I've been bulking now for five weeks at you know 500 calories above maintenance. Mm -hmm. Now I feel like I'm stuffing myself, or I feel like I'm force feeding myself. I don't want to eat any right. more food. I just uh, I don't I don't feel it right it's now. It's a job. Yeah, you throw in a couple days of maintenance, or even a couple days of a slight cut, like 100 calories be below maintenance, and you watch what happens to your appetite. Right. All of a sudden, you start to feel Plus good. You give your digestive system a bit of a break. You yes, know, you know it, it, it's demanding on on your digestive system to really like uh, intake all this 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 influx of food all the time and you know and there may be you know an assimilation uh, factor to that as well in terms of now you know reintroducing uh that much volume being able to assimilate the food and and shuttle it to you know muscles as well so i like a i like a four four week to to one one week and i like to cut actually even more so i even like to be a little bit more drastic so instead of just trying to be maintenance i'd like to be in a a deficit by a couple hundred calories for a whole week and then jump and then, back and on. then go jump back into the bulk. I find it, what it does for me too. Another thing that I, I always notice is whenever I would go on these bulks for a long period of time, uh, and I'm sure anybody who's done this too, has experienced this. Like you just feel like at one point you're like, Oh my God, all I do is eat and I can't, I can't gain anymore. I'm like stuck in this plateau. Yeah. You take that person and, uh, or I used to do fast. I would do this just to show, show this in examples, fast the next day or run a calorie deficit for a week and then watch how much your appetite kicks back up again. Then you feel like you're hungry again. And it's just easier to get back in, in that rhythm. Plus in that week's time of being in a calorie deficit, if we did put a little bit of tiny bit of body fat on from your surplus, exactly. now I'm going to, that's going to lean out and then I'm going to go right back to, to bulking again. So I love kind of this and again you could play with this but personally i like the four to one most of our programs are broken in phases too so that's another reason why i like it you're running a four week phase in a bulk but then all of a sudden you go to phase two of one of our programs and boom i'm also doing a cut for like a week so my body kind of responds to both the new stimulus and the calorie deficit and then i'm back into a surplus again. and here's what else i noticed now let's talk about the physiological i notice for myself and people that i've trained 
it's as if the body, even if you're doing everything right, it starts to become resistant to what you're doing. So we're doing this bulk, we're doing this workout, we're doing everything right, and we're seeing muscle come up. And then I start to see muscle start to plateau a little bit and fat gains start to accelerate as if the body is used to the signal and saying, eh, you know, let's, let's, you know, it becomes resistant in other words and cutting for a short period of time, in my opinion, interrupts that resensitizes yeah. the body. Now there are some studies that suggest they're not clear, but they do suggest that we start to become desensitized to protein. For example, when it's high all the time and throwing in a little bit of a lower protein day resensitizes the body. Here's some more evidence for anybody that's ever competed in a stage presentation sport, bikini or bodybuilding or physique, the best gains you've ever experienced in your entire life are always right after the show. It's like you were on this extreme diet, you're super shredded. After the show, you eat way more food, you go back to your workouts, and you don't gain body fat for a little while. At first, it's like you just build all this crazy muscle and you feel more anabolic than you've ever felt before. And so part of this mini cut that you're throwing in there is trying to simulate that and resensitize the body to your bulk. And then, of course, to your point, Adam, if you're really sensitive to gaining body fat and you just want to gain lean body mass, it makes sense to throw in a little shortcut you know, after you've, you've bulked for a while. Now, one more thing we should address with nutrition are gut issues. Gut issues tend to be more common in bulks than they tend to be in cuts. Anytime you have more food in your body, I think you're increasing the amount of potential inflammation and you're just eating more of things that might irritate or bother your gut. Be very smart about this and wary about this. I know people who try to bulk with lots of, for example, wheat products, pasta and bread. And although a lot of people have no problem digesting those things, when they start to push the calories with those things, in my experience, and I'm just using one example, by the way, in my experience, a lot of them start to get kind of inflamed or bloated uh, in their gut or they hold more water. Sometimes you see this with dairy. You know, somebody's like, you know, I, I have no problem with dairy. But then they start to push the dairy and all of a sudden mm -hmm. they're like, oh, it's it's not agreeing with my with my gut. If you start to develop gut issues and digestive issues, you're less likely to build muscle, more likely to store body fat, and your health starts to decline. So you want to avoid this by trying to eat the most easily digestible foods when you're bulking. It also it'll throw you off mentally too. Like you, let's say you're you're dieting really well and you and you are dialed in calorie wise, but you're eating something that is offensive to you or that you have an intolerance to. And then all of a sudden you see this bloat and water retention. And a lot of times what happens is you, you see that out. and you freak out and you go the other direction. Oh shit, too many calories. I got to right. back off when really it's just some inflammation and water retention that you're dealing with because you're eating something that your, your gut doesn't agree with. And so you're seeing a temporary response to that, not a, oh, I was eating way too many calories. Mm -hmm. And so this is what you see happen to a lot of people is they, they think they're following a plan really well. They eat a food that maybe they don't realize that they have issues with. And then that also gives them this bloat, water retention. Yeah. And they go, oh my God, they jump on oh some my cardio. God, I'm gaining or, body fat all of a sudden. Right. They think they're getting fatter. And so they jump on the cardio or reduce calories even more when really their their caloric intake and macro profile was, was perfect. It's just they had something that they have an intolerance to. And because they're in a surplus, it's way more offensive, yeah. right? And so then they see that. By the way, this happens with cutting too. People will cut carbs and lose water. Oh my God, I'm losing body fat. Yeah. You know, No, actually you lost four pounds of water. <laughs> yeah. uh, so you feel leaner, but it's not really body fat. Uh, which takes me to the next thing. It's very important that you track your lean body mass if your goal is to bulk without gaining body fat. It's like, how do you know that the weight that you're gaining, uh, especially in the early stages, is muscle, not body fat? Now, there's, there's two types of people that get confused by this. There's the person like me, who thinks every pound on the scale is a gift from God. This is great. As long as I get heavier, I don't care. And then there's a person that's so afraid of every pound that goes up on the scale that they're like, oh my gosh, I'm gaining body fat. Like, how do we reconcile this? Track your lean body mass. What's the best way to do this? Body fat testing. Now, here's the, the key with body fat testing. I don't care, generally speaking, which way you test your body fat. There's definitely some that are more accurate than others, right? Underwater weighing is the most accurate. It's also the most inconvenient. Like most of us don't have access to a, a dunk tank on a regular right. basis. You have calipers, right? Calipers less accurate, but whatever. And then you have electronic impedance, which is probably the least accurate. But here's the key to all of them. Do them all exactly the same at the same time, the same hydration, the same fed state. That'll give you the most consistency 
with your body fat readings because what you're looking for is not so much what body fat percentage I'm at, but rather the direction yes. that it's moving. Because if I get a body, uh, let's use calipers. I like calipers because that's what I always use with my clients. It's pretty easy. They're inexpensive. You can buy a pair of calipers on Amazon for nothing and whatever. Here's the key with calipers. Same time, same place, same fed state, and get tested by the same person. This yeah. is really important. Well, it varies dramatically person to person well, that tests. That's the only reason why I tend to be the one that all of us that kind of knock on the calipers the most is because of that. Because it requires another person and another person consistently at all those points. Yeah. You the time you're fed, the, how much water mm -hmm. you have in you, the time of day, what day you're doing it, the same person. So I just prefer something that's more consistent, something that I have more control of. And so if that's a, you know, a, you know, which we call it electronic computer, yeah, electronic one. That's fine. It, and again, to your point, which is exactly how I always have this conversation with people that are like, "Well, I read that this is X percent accurate, and yeah. this is inconsistent, and those things are no. It, it doesn't matter what it says. We are just using this as a map for us. It's just a, a guide. Okay, you're at X, whatever it is, doesn't matter. Now we decide we're going to add calories or take them away or change your program. When I went back and I measured the exact same time, everything all lined up like Sal's saying in two weeks. What did we see? Did you go up in lean body mass from that? Or did you go up in body fat? Or did you stay the same? And that's what we're that's all we're using it for. Yeah. And by the way, don't uh you know, marry the a single result. What you want to look at is trends. You want to look at trends because it could change a little bit in a week and you could freak out about it. But really look at the trends after three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, which direction is it moving? And usually it looks like it's not linear. It's not like perfect lean body mass gain, but it's kind of the step ladder that starts to move in a direction. This is a really great way to kind of track your progress. What direction am I moving? Am I moving in the right direction or am I moving in the wrong direction? And this is why I hate the scale for this reason. Like, although I would use the scale as just another tool for me to reflect on, th there's a a lot of deception with the scale because it goes up and down so much. So much. Back like to my point about having something that your your gut doesn't agree with and all of a sudden you are inflamed a little bit or you start retaining water, you might see the scale go up two, three pounds yeah, pounds. easily. If you hold on to some water because of something on mm -hmm. it going on in your gut, you'll easily do that. And you don't want to all of a sudden make some some drastic changes on the scale. And the same thing is true in the opposite. Sometimes you'll just have drank less water that day unless you are measuring and tracking every ounce of water you're, you're consuming. Maybe today I was behind on water or I was less thirsty or I didn't eat a lot of salty foods. And so you have four or five glasses is less of water one day than another, and then you could see that the scale yeah. goes down. So be careful of measuring with the scale and allowing that to influ influence you in the direction that you're going nutritionally. Yeah. You know what it used to do to me, this just to illustrate how it can deceive you, because I always wanted to gain, I would start to lean towards the foods that made me hold water. Totally. Because the scale would go mm -hmm. up. So, oh, uh, you know, a burrito? Wow, that's a good mass gainer. Whoa, pizza. Yeah. There's something magical Burgers. about pizza. Yeah, yeah. and then I'll weigh myself at the end of the day instead of the beginning of the day because you can make yourself gain weight throughout the day by eating certain foods. So oh, I was so obsessed with this as a kid that I remember I would actually – weigh every every morning when I wake up and then I my goal was to go to bed a pound heavier than what I did. Oh like my gosh, night. I did the same and thing. And I would be, I would go stuff myself with stuff. I mean, that's how crazy. Eat a pound of food. So you have yeah, a pound of food. Yeah, that's yourself. literally what I would do. And so it's terrible. It's, and, I, and I struggled with adding muscle and keeping body fat off. It wasn't until way later when I didn't have all those issues yeah. when I was <laughs> trying to gain that I had Here's success. how you should use a scale. Take your body fat test and then use the scale to subtract to figure out lean body mass. That's how I think you should right. Use a scale. Mm -hmm. And that's it, by the way. Only weigh yourself when you do your body fat test. And you should body fat test no more frequently than once a week. I like once every two weeks. I think once a week might even be a little too yeah, much. It'll get in your head otherwise. Right. Sure. Now, the, the other one, and I know you, Sal, a lot. I know Doug, too, was big on the Doug still, I think, to this day, actually uses this as his main marker, which is circumference measurements. Yeah, I like these. I yeah. like circumference measurements a lot. Yeah. Because especially, in, and Doug makes the point of like really just focusing on your waist. You can see a lot. Uh, you know, if your waist is pretty much the same uh, while you're getting stronger and your your body's changing elsewhere, you know, like it, especially, you know, with certain people that trap a lot of fat 
uh, you know, in, in their waistline, uh, yeah. it's very visible. So that's, that's one that you can see difference like right away if you're, if you're doing good or, or, you know, you might need to adjust. Yeah. I think this is part of all the metrics that we're talking about. You do the body fat test, you use the scale to subtract to find lean body mass and do the circumference measurements. I think you have a really, really good idea if you do those, but yeah, for men, especially waist tends to be a good one because we tend to store body fat in our waist. And I remember piecing this together for myself. When I would bulk, I would wear a weight belt whenever I would deadlift or squat real heavy, and I'd have to move down a couple notches or move up. Right. And then there were times, this is later on when I got really smart with bulking, I would gain five pounds on the scale and the belt would be on the same small setting. That, to like, me, that's like what you're looking for. Yeah. That mm -hmm. is the goal. The goal is, can I put on, how much can I put on weight and not yeah. let the waist move. Can I get bigger, but keep my yeah, waist Yeah, if, if your waist the same. can stay the same while you continually put weight on, you're you're doing a really good job of, of probably building lean mass and putting on very little to no body fat. Totally. All right, so the last one, or one of the last ones, is sleep. Uh, how important sleep is for building muscle and burning body fat. Now, consider this, right? If you are not sleeping optimally, either not getting enough time you know, in bed or just not sleeping well at night, this is a stress signal to the body. And remember, storing body fat is an insurance that your body has uh, during times of stress. And building muscle is expensive and it increases your liability for survival. So trying to build muscle when your body is stressed from lack of sleep Boy, that's that's running uphill uh, mm -hmm. with a with a backpack that's heavy on your back. Like, good luck. That's really really tough. Now I know a lot of people they they get away with having less sleep because of caffeine and pre workout drinks, and they're like, oh, I still gained a little bit of muscle, I, but you don't know how much muscle you could have gained. Mm -hmm. This is the big thing. Like, especially if you've got good genetics and everything else is perfect, and your sleep isn't terrible, terrible, but it's not optimized, and you're still making progress. You might dismiss sleep as something that's not important. Try getting, make it a focus to get good sleep just for one week. Keep everything else the same. And I promise you'll blow yourself away by how big of an impact it has on Well, on we just goals. have to keep drilling this point of how the importance of recovery just over and over again because the marketing out there is so much in opposition to this. It's all about like how much intensity and, you know, how crazy your workouts are that, uh, and it's all about the insult and it's not about the actual process of your body rebuilding itself and uh, recovering fully so that way now you adapt in that direction versus just healing from the insult that you presented it. Which yeah. is where the real muscle being built is. I mean, you don't have to send much of a signal in the gym if you do a really good job of feeding the body what it needs and giving it adequate recovery. Totally. I mean, if you do that, it's it's going to build muscle. The other thing with sleep too, and this is like, you know, we talk a lot about behavior stuff. When you're trying to stick to a diet and be consistent, one of the things I, and this actually took me a long time to piece this together, uh, where I would notice that on days where I had really poor sleep, the next day my cravings would always be crazy. Yep. And oh, I didn't yeah. I never connected that. I just thought like, oh, some days I have cravings, some days I don't. It took me a long time to connect the dots that it, how much it had to do with sleep. Totally. I didn't notice that until way later in my career when I cared more about sleep and I started paying attention to that, started to build routines around it. Then I started to notice these things. And boy, like clockwork, if I have had a shitty night of sleep, you can guarantee the next day around noontime or so, all of a sudden I'm craving this food that I ha I haven't had or even wanted in maybe even years and it's so weird how that how that happens and when you don't get good sleep the next there's day. studies that support this 100 percent adam you're you're looking for dopamine you're looking for serotonin so hyper palatable foods you know this is why you want junk food mm -hmm. when you stay up real late with you know real late with your boys and you want to go out and eat it's never healthy right your, your willpower goes down when you're tired by the way sleep deprivation is one of the number one ways that uh that countries would break prisoners of war like you want somebody to confess positions of you know their their military or bases one of the most effective ways to do that is deprive them of sleep it <laughs> literally destroys your willpower and discipline so if you're like eating healthy and being consistent with your workouts and you're chronically sleep deprived you're screwed you're you've got your you've that muscle that willpower muscle is totally destroyed also one of the easiest if i if somebody told me if somebody came up to me and made a weird bet and said, hey, Sal, 
I would like for you to negatively influence someone's hormones in two days, oh, yeah. and I'll give you money if you make it like really dramatic. Just fuck with their sleep. That's it. That would be yeah. the easiest way to do it. Just, it's, just buy some air horns. It's one of the e it's one of the fastest ways that guys can get their testosterone levels to crash. It's one of the easiest ways to get men and women's cortisol levels to spike. It's very easy to get a woman's estrogen and progesterone to get thrown off just by taking away or or influencing their, influencing their sleep in negative ways. That's how big of a difference it makes. So if you're trying to bulk and gain muscle, like we said in the beginning, you're trying to tell your body, increase your liability and reduce your insurance, you need to give your body adequate rest because it can't be under lack of sleep stress and do that. It's just not going to work. All right, the last one you probably are going to think has nothing to do with bulking whatsoever which is cardio. So let's talk a little bit about cardio. I know, Adam, this was one that you really wanted to touch upon. Yeah, I um, and I know there's, I definitely know there's uh, influencers and people in our space that are going to disagree with this, but and this is my opinion, and I'll take on whatever debate you want to have with this, but when I'm coaching and I'm teaching somebody to do this, right, figure out the their calorie intake and their programming to to get the, what Justin called the Goldilocks, right, this, this build muscle, don't put on body fat. It's like the most perfect place to be. I actually don't want to add any more variables than I need to. And cardio is a variable that I do not need in order to build muscle or lose body fat. It is just a tool and a tool that I can use at my disposal whenever I want to speed that process up. And I don't want to abuse that. And I most certainly don't want to build what will look like what how because this is a consistent place I'd like to live, you know, constantly kind of building a little bit of muscle, not putting body fat on. Yeah. The majority of my life, I'd like to be kind of in this place. So if this is an area where I'd like to be a majority of my life, as far as nutritionally and training, I want to take out as many variables as I can or that I don't need. And cardio is one of those. I don't need that. And so I don't want to put it in there. And then I have to adjust also my training and also my calories around this cardio regimen that I've built. So I'd rather build it around just nutrition and just training. And then I can use cardio as a tool to manipulate whatever I'm seeing when I'm tracking my body fat percentage week you, over week. You know, I've never heard you present it that way. That's probably mm -hmm. one of the most compelling uh, cases I've ever heard for not adding cardio during a bulk. So I have to completely agree with you. Now, the other case that we often make is that cardio sends this competing signal. Endurance, uh, tends, endurance type training tends to tell the body to pare muscle down and become more efficient with calories, which is contrary to the goal that we have. Now, just for the sake of this podcast and just to present an alternative side to this, there may be some benefit to doing cardio for people where cardiovascular fitness or their lack of cardiovascular fitness is preventing them from working out properly. This is where I see maybe some benefit, right? Mm. So there may be some of you that just- It's affecting their workouts. Yeah, you like you're, the endurance. you're so deconditioned, you know, cardiovascularly that, you, you know, you, you're trying to do 10 reps on a, a exercise and it's just, you just don't have the gas. You just don't have the stamina. In which case, I think a little bit of cardio can help with that. Uh, so that would be a case. Here's the other side of this. I don't think I think it's important just to be active daily anyway, yeah. just for health. And being healthier is always going to help you build more muscle. But this doesn't look like structured cardio. Rather, this is more like just moving throughout the day. Yeah, that walking. was more the angle I was uh, going to present, and it, it looks a little bit more like neat, so like uh, non-exercise specific. But um, you know, that's just really moving consistently throughout the day and and making that a priority. But that's just like making sure all the systems are working. And, you know, uh, you're, you're, you're basically just, um, you know, doing all the things you can to keep a, a nice, thriving, healthy body. So that environment is good for you to build muscle. So, I mean, I'll play devil's advocate with my own point, right? The way, the, where I would maybe have different advice is if I do have a client that when I assess them, they, they're extremely sedentary. And that, so they're going to fall in that category yeah. you're talking about. If you're somebody who gets less than 2,000 steps a day because you work from home and it's at, a, at your computer all day long and maybe you walk the dog at most or that's about it and you and then you get you know under 2,000 steps a day and all we're doing is you know maps anabolic three days a week like oh yeah I'm gonna I'm gonna assign some you know level low intensity cardio for this person it's because like walking yeah for health purposes forget your goal of building muscle losing body fat it has nothing to do with that it purely has I think it's 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 in your best interest to be doing somewhat of cardio for overall health which is only going to help you long term anyway so that's the only other place where i feel like i would i would recommend this 
And even if even then, I'd still, even though I was playing devil's advocate, I still would probably build the routine without it, and then I would introduce it right. after the fact. Because to me, that's the most important part yeah. of this argument yeah, totally is that you know I, I'm thinking forever, and I want to know what, what what's working. Yeah, what's working without that. And then if I now I see, oh wow, I put on a little bit of body fat in the last three weeks from my bulk, I can either one reduce the calories or hey now maybe i'll introduce a half hour of you know steady state cardio in there and that is how i'm going to create the deficit and so you can use it that way and i would base that based off of how healthy of the calories and my client if my client says hey adam i already feel like i'm cutting a lot it's hard for me to only eat this well i'm probably not going to restrict them even further i might in introduce more movement instead yeah very well said look if you like our content you like this information head over to mindpumpfree.com Check out all of our free guides. They can help you build muscle, burn body fat, improve your fitness, alleviate pain. We even have guides for personal trainers. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at mindpumpjustin. You can find me at mindpumpsal and Adam at mindpumpadam.